So in disclosure, I have consulting relationships with a number of biotech companies that are involved in the development of novel biomarkers for acute disease states. And I'd like to mention that the opinions in my portion of the lecture are uniquely my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of any particular body. I might discuss research in off-label uh, usage of diagnostics and medications if it is pertinent to, to improving the knowledge base of clinicians. So at the end of my 20 minutes of this talk, hopefully you'll be able to discuss the scope of sepsis, which most of you are probably familiar with at this, this particular Congress, its impacts and costs upon the healthcare system. Identify the difficulties associated with the rapid diagnosis of sepsis with the focus of differentiation of bacterial from non-bacterial causes of SIRS, and to utilize the performance characteristics of procalcitonin to aid in clinical assessment of uh, patients presenting with suspected bacterial infection. So uh, this is probably not news to any of you, the projected rise of severe sepsis. Uh, there was actually some data at this meeting uh, describing how sepsis is now eclipsing most of the other known um, bad boys of, of medicine with respect to readmissions in the United States. And it's reflected as well in this data uh, with the rise of severe sepsis, uh, greater than the growth of population in the United States. It is, uh, of course, a major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide, not just in the United States. Uh, generally the 10th leading cause of death in, in most countries for adults, with more than 750 cases in the U.S. annually. Um, the mortality is uh, about eight times higher for patients than sepsis with most of the other severe disease conditions. So what are the, some of the diagnostic challenges associated with sepsis that are unique or special for the emergency department? The differentiation between sepsis and non-infectious non causes of SIRS is complicated for anyone, but in the all-commerce population of the emergency department, it is, uh, is even more complicated by the second bullet here, which is the, I don't know, the, feedback. the uh, large number of patients presenting to the emergency room at the same time can limit the ability to obtain a real thorough history of physical examination, something that I always feel a little jealous of the hospitalist and intensivist because they have that time to collect a lot of data. On a busy Friday night, my, my time with the patient can be four minutes gathering history, physical, and making a plan. Um, additionally, uh, scoring systems and a lot of the commonly available diagnostic tools that are designed for sepsis uh, really focus on the ICU, so SOFA, QSOFA. Um, and these tools provide limited value in determining which patients will have a poor outcome when you look at the all comer setting of the emergency department. The other thing that really is a, a problem for us is initial signs and vital signs can be incomplete, particularly for a patient coming in critically ill. We'll often have a, uh, a heart rate and sometimes we'll have a blood pressure. It'll be close to something over the health if the patient's not doing very well. And one of the things that, that, that is very difficult to get is an accurate core temperature. Until we've recently built our new tower of our hospital, almost all of our initial emergency care was in the hallway. And for those of you that are clinicians, obtaining a, a core temperature in that particular setting can be a rel relatively delicate maneuver. So we're actually just dealing with oral temperatures and not knowing the patient's core body temperature. One of the other problems with the, the diagnosis of sepsis, uh, clinging mostly to the old uh, nomenclature of SIRS, is that we've been thwarted by our own development in medical technology, and we've lost some SIRS criteria to some of our advances. For instance, white blood cell count can be uh, affected by GCSF factors artificially. And heart rate, uh, we my average patient over 75 may not have their endogenous heart rate anymore because it's been impacted by beta blockers or by pacemakers. All these limitations combined can result in the delayed diagnosis of sepsis. And since we've got that golden hour to, to act upon a septic patient, it really does increase the risk of morbidity and mortality for those patients. So sepsis definition is an evolving target. We saw data at this meeting last year that have suggested sepsis 3.0. It's got various names depending on who you ask about the definitions, but a lot of the historic sepsis research is based upon old definitions. Um, Dr. Gl I actually had a sneak peek at my, my colleague's slides, and Dr. Gluck is going to discuss this much more eloquently in his talk than, than an ED doc can do in his. So I'll just start out from the perspective of start out with an infection and things just get really bad all of a sudden. Historically, the SIRS criteria, uh, you're, you're probably aware of a high temperature, low temperature, tachycardia, uh, tachypnea, or a low PCA02, a leukocytosis, or leukopenia. Now, the, the complex definition of sepsis, which historically was uh, SIRS, uh, two SIRS criteria plus a suspected source of infection, and, and there were a number of 
general inflammatory variables, uh, hemodynamic variables, organ dysfunction scores, and tissue perfusion variables. A lot of these are kept in the definition of sepsis 3.0 as the endpoint, um, but I think we'll discuss that really briefly. Um, this slide I still use for teaching, even though we moved away from the classic SIRS definition to, to bring home the point that in the emergency department, we have a lot of people presenting with systemic inflammatory responses who do not necessarily have sepsis. And there's, there's where the important ability to differentiate whether that patient has an underlying bacterial infection from a non-bacterial cause of SIRS. So historically, um, the ACCP, SCCM definitions of sepsis involved sepsis being SIRS plus a known or suspected infection. Uh, severe sepsis, uh, which is a category missing from sepsis 3.0, was sepsis associated with organ dysfunction, hypoperfusion, or hypotension. And septic shock being septic, septic, sepsis-induced hypotension despite adequate fluid resuscitation. Now, a very brief word about the 2016 sepsis definition changes. Uh, as we know, sometimes uh, the specialty societies will promulgate, will thoroughly research and then promulgate new definitions. And then there's a time of adaptation and response to these. And I think at least in the emergency medicine setting, we're starting to adjust to these and we'll have to see what happens with sepsis 3.0. But 2016, uh, the SCCM, uh, the, the Joint Task Force, defined sepsis as life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. I certainly agree with that. Sepsis uh, was, uh, was defined as a change in the, the, the Q-SOFA score plus a source of infection. Therefore, Q-SOFA essentially replaced SIRS. And there were various arguments that it had increased sensitivity or specificity for sepsis over SIRS. Um, there are other tools as well that can do this, but the QSOFA was thought to be a rapid and reliable one. Um, however, there's the clinical determination about whether infection exists in these patients is, is still the diagnostic area that's really un, an unmet need and could really best be decided by uh, biomarker decision making. What hasn't changed with respect to whether, whether how you define sepsis was that the early action reduces mortality risk in these patients. And if you want to quibble about whether EGDD uh, has any change over uh, standard of care with patients, one thing that's, that's clear and remains true is that the early initiation of antibiotics uh, is inversely associated with mortality risk in these patients. And this, this data, this, this, this cause and effect hasn't changed very much since this data was initially studied about 10 years ago. So how does procalcitonin fit into this picture with the, the differentiation of bacterial from non-bacterial causes of SIRS? This is the, the obligatory schematic of the molecule, procalcitonin. Uh, a very interesting story of uh, how it was discovered. I don't really have time to go into this talk about it, but it's a propeptide of a of hormonally active calcitonin. Uh, but it has a unique property in that it's specifically induced by bacterial infections. Very low levels exist during viral infections or in other inflammatory states where we might see a febrile response, such as autoimmune disorders. Um, this showing uh, basically the, the, the schematic of the molecule uh, when uh, the, uh, uh, the protein is cleaved to uh, calcitonin, uh, it's no longer essentially a procalcitonin. Now, what happens with expressions? We look at and the left side of this diagram in healthy individuals. Uh, calcitonin is, is produced in, normally in response to a physiologic need uh, and primarily uh, by the thyroid. Now, there's an interesting switch that occurs during systemic in, uh, inflammation caused by bacterial infection. And you can see in the right-sided diagram that pretty much every tissue in the body lights up in response. There's a, there is a, a large systemic response uh, of procalcitonin production in, in tissues that don't typically elaborate calcitonin. So there's a a change in the biology, and I think Dr. Gluck might talk a little bit more about that during his part. This change is, uh, is very unique in the sense that there's a bacterial specificity involved. And uh, you'll, the bacterial toxins that we see, both gram-positive, uh, such as peptidoglycan, and gram-negative, such as endotoxin, and the, the cytokines that are stimulated, uh, result in a hormokine-type uh, stimulation of procalcitonin that is constitutively released from parenchymal cells. Now, alternatively, what happens with uh, the viral response, so the viral mediators such as interferon gamma, will block this response. So there's no procalcitonin release from those tissues. Um, another nice thing uh, that I think is cool about uh, biomarkers that are useful is that they have a dynamic range. 
where there's not such a tight cutoff between bad and good from the simplistic ED dot perspective. And procalcitonin is, is just happens to fall into that nice category that you and I are presumably now sitting down and having uh, procalcitonin levels of 0 0.05 or less. And I can reliably tell whether somebody in this room is, is, is at risk for serious bacterial infection because your procalcitonin level is going to be an order of magnitude or greater than a normal individual. So there's a, this just happened to be that biology worked in its favor. Um, the PCT values have to be interpreted in the individual context of the patient. Uh, and it's important to be aware of conditions, and we'll talk a little bit about this uh, in the coming slide, uh, conditions that can influence the PCT value. And then to think about the dynamics of the disease process. Is this patient at the beginning of the disease process? Did I catch them in the middle? Are they coming to the ED after two days of fever? Or am I seeing them at the end in the convalescent phase? And then um, the, the final thing is that uh, for localized infections, uh, you know, sensitive assay has to be used and low cutoffs have to be applied. So like any other biomarker, we'd like to think everything is perfect. And, and the same way I think about troponin for uh, myocardial infarction or BNP for heart failure, it's important to note that potential areas where the test may generate false positives or false negatives to have these in the back of your mind when you're interpreting these. And there are there cases where PCT may be elevated in the absence of a bacterial etiology? And the answer is yes. Uh, we see a cytokine burst during uh, the insults of major trauma and burn. Uh, so there's a systemic release of cytokines that, that occurs during the first 24, 48 hours. And procalcitonin may be elevated in those patients absent uh, a serious bacterial infection. It turns out that some trauma surgeons actually use that to their advantage, and they will actually check the patient's uh, uh, procalcitonin on arrival at the first 24 hours and 48 hours. And if they, they see that the patient comes down and then goes back up during their hospitalization, that's an alert that the patient may uh, be developing an in-hospital infection post-trauma or post-burn. Um, newborns under the, se uh, the uh, 72 hours of age will actually have a, a different procalcitonin release curve, and, and some have developed nomograms, just as you would with bilirubin, for example, that are used for certain days of life uh, in, in infants. Um, molecular treatments with cytokines will logically uh, cause an increase in, in cytokine-induced hormones like uh, procalcitonin, and there are certain malignancies where procalcitonin may be artificially elevated. Conversely, can low PCT exist in the, in, in a, uh, when there's a true bacterial etiology? I think the major example of this might be localized, well-walled-off abscesses, where that there can't be a, a, a signal systemically to elicit procalcitonin production. Uh, uh, production. In subacute endocarditis, when uh, a vegetation on the bacterial valve is only intermittently showering into the bloodstream, it might not be possible to uh, to generate a sustained PCT response in those, those patients. And then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, abscesses would be an example where that patient does have a bacterial infection. Uh, but it's so walled off on the circulation that we don't see PCT, we don't necessarily see PCT levels elevating. Uh, this is the, uh, the statement on uh, pro, uh, procalcitonin's FDA clearance on the, the BROM system. There are other clearances, and this is a question that gives specific uh, thought or questions about what uh, your assay at your institution is approved for. It may be best to ask your, your laboratory about that. Um, Procalcitonin ex has existed, uh, we are about 10 years behind the curve of Europeans where this test was available uh, right in the early 2000s. So it became commercially available in the US around 2006 or 7, uh, and is now uh, uh, finally in a number of American guidelines, including this 2008 guideline of ACCM IDSA and for the evaluation of fever. Um, there are also um, a number of other uh, guidelines. I don't want to go into the level of evidence, but it will depend on which specialty society um, is, has viewed the biomarker and how they, they implement it into practice or recommend its implementation of practice. But the, the fact of the matter remains is, is what I have in terms of my arsenal for the detection of a bacterial infection is relatively limited in the short period of time that I have with patients, which can be anywhere from 30 minutes to three or four hours before their disposition from the emergency department. Uh, cultures are, uh, have a high degree of specificity, blood, urine, CSF, uh, but I'd like to see if anybody out there gets the results of uh, their urine cultures and blood cultures back in their first three hours of the patient's stay in the hospital. If you've got that secret down, I'd like to know how. Um, a lot of our traditional markers are, are very nonspecific, CBC. We, we like to say that, oh, CBC is a nonspecific. We go ahead and order on everybody anyway. 
not really sure why, because it doesn't give us a clue as to the disease etiology most of the time. Um, and then a number of the inflammatory markers and acute phase reactants, which we have historically relied upon, CRP and ESR, um, really don't give us a very clear idea whether this is an inflammatory response or a bacterial infection. Uh, the kinetics of this are very useful. So PCT uh, depicted here in orange, yellow, I don't know, some color blind, but the color is, uh, has a release pattern that's very um, prompt in response to the cytokine system that is production. So if I were to have a panel available of IL-6, IL-10, TNF, the right ratio and recipe to, to indicate that that was going to trigger a bacterial infection, that might give me a little bit of heads up over PCT, but you can see that compared to uh, more traditional biomarkers, the, the release kinetics of PCT are such that we see a response a several hours before more uh, classic biomarkers such as COP. So the elevated or rising PCT levels uh, in systemic response to bacterial infection uh, indicate that that patient is going in the wrong direction. It's pretty simple. This is a bad signal. This patient's probably not going to do well unless we do something about it. Um, the low PCT values in the clinical presentation where I still have a high index of suspicion that this patient has an infection, uh, could be that the patient has a self-limiting infection, that maybe I should broaden my differential because sometimes maybe I'm a little bit chauvinistic and I've narrowed it down too quickly. Then I need to start thinking about non-infection infectious causes. Maybe this patient, this is a manifestation of an autoimmune disease or a checkpoint inhibitor related side effect. Um, and then uh, the early phase of the infection. Sometimes people do come into the emergency department two hours after realizing something's horribly wrong. Their procalcitonin may have not mounted to a, 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 a threshold level. Those, it's recommended that those patients be rechecked in 12 hours or whatever the appropriate time course is where they might actually start uh, elucidating the biomarker. Now, uh, this uh, is another kinetic curve showing the procalcitonin response to effective treatment. Um, the peak uh, of uh, response is going to be about 12 to 24 hours. And if the clinician's done his or her job correctly, we should start seeing a pretty good fall of that procalcitonin. It, it just is semi-miraculous that this biomarker has a half-life of 24 hours, so it, it lends itself towards our, our morning rounding of the, the hospitalist and, and knowing what's, what's, uh, whether the patient's had an effective treatment for the last day. Uh, on the other hand, if you haven't been doing your job or you've chosen the wrong antibiotics or you haven't eliminated the source, which turned out to be a surgical source, then that procalcitonin is either going to remain high or perhaps even go higher. So uh, in summary, whatever diagnostic terminology will evolve, uh, sepsis is a deadly, difficult to detect, and it is extremely difficult to detect in the unsorted environment of the emergency department. And we really haven't figured out what's going on with the patient in terms of bacterial or uh, other source of infection or so of uh, uh, SIRS. Procalcitonin is a uh, reliable and ready uh, measurable of serious bacterial infection and has the unique differential of when we have a large influx of seasonal influenza or other viral illnesses of being a, 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 a poor tender of, of a bad outcome in those patients. The interpretation of, of procalcitonin and the procalcitonin response to therapy provides some very important prognostic information about those patients to the, treat to the initial treating clinician and to downstream providers. So that's my spiel. <laughs>